Jane's addiction would help bring alternative rock to the forefront in the late 80s and early 90s, but their time together would be short-lived, only releasing two albums before the band imploded. Frontman Perry Farrell would soldier on with his new projects, including Lollapalooza, a dark drug-influenced semi-autobiographical film named Gift, and Porno for Pyros, a band a lot of people have requested on my channel, so let's get to it. Growing up in a broken home in Queens, New York, frontman Perry Farrell would leave home at the age of 17 and hop on a bus and head for Hemet, California, where a friend of his lived. He would look back at his upbringing saying, Now after years of my father telling me I'm never going to do anything, now I'm signed to Warner Brothers, and he says we're best friends. Put it this way, I hated my parents when I was a kid like everybody else and I left. If I wanted to, I could have stayed home and been a fat little Jewish kid and had my dad start a business for me. In 1986, Farrell would join up with drummer Stephen Perkins, guitarist Dave Navarro, and bassist Eric Avery, forming Jane's Addiction. The quartet would soon become one of the hottest bands in LA's underground club scene. They would release two studio albums, including Nothing Shocking in 1988, and their follow-up 1990s Ritual de la Habitual. But drug abuse and egos cannibalized the group, and by 1991, they were done. Following the group's demise, Perry Farrell had other avenues to explore, and he wanted to bring along drummer Stephen Perkins with him. He would tell the LA Times in 1993 where Jane's addiction went wrong, revealing, I just knew that I couldn't conceive of playing indefinitely with people I don't get along with. We weren't getting along to the point that nobody was listening to musical ideas. If I said, hey man, let's try being adventurous here and putting, say, a flange on this instrument, if you're not friends, you don't listen to me. You tend to block out any suggestions. Suggestions grounded in love are always accepted. When they're not grounded in love, everybody becomes cunning and wary of each other, he'd say. By early 1992, Farrell would rejoin with drummer Stephen Perkins, who had just finished up playing with Mike Muir. Farrell would meet guitarist Peter DiStefano during a surfing trip to Mexico, and the three-piece of Farrell, Perkins, and DiStefano decided to form a band, and now they just needed to audition bass players. DiStefano would recommend a friend of his he knew from the LA scene of the 80s, who is now living in Holland, a bassist named Martin Lenoble, who most famously played in the group The Thelonious Monster. Lenoble, for his part, almost never made it to the audition, as he had a string of bad luck the morning of meeting the band for the first time. Lenoble had just been evicted from his apartment he was living in. When he drove to the rehearsal, his car broke down, resulting in him walking to meet the group. He almost turned around and headed back, recalling in the book Perry Farrell, The Sega of a Hypster. But when we started playing, I knew. The band would produce a three-song demo in one day that got the attention of Warner Brothers, who signed the group. By March of 1992, the band would end up coming up with a name, Porno for Pyros. The name of the group has been the subject of much debate. Spin Magazine, who did a profile on the band in 1993, as well as the book I just mentioned, Perry Farrell, The Sega of a Hypester, would claim that the band got their name from a magazine and not the LA Riots. With the book claiming that the band came up with a name in March of 1992, almost a month before the riots broke out. But the book Horrors and Oral Biography Perry Farrell and Jane's Addiction claims the name was inspired by the LA riots, so take of it what you guys will. The group's live debut would happen on April 4th, 1992 at the Hollywood Palladium as part of a Magic Johnson's AIDS benefit show alongside the Beastie Boys, the Red Hot Chili Peppers, and Henry Rollins. Fans who turned up to the band's shows may have been disappointed to see that no material from Jane's Addiction's catalog was played by Porno for Pyros, with Farrell recalling at the time, I don't want to be like Chuck Berry, doing the duck walk across the stage singing Maybelline, just because some 18 year old jerk never got to see him do it. To me, it's like, well, you never got to see me do it? Too bad. Look at a film. Let me get on to something else. I'm bored, he'd say. The band was in LA at Crystal Studios when the LA riots broke out in April of 1992. Farrell would look back at the riots saying, It got kind of scary. Man, I kind of want to go back out on the street without thinking someone's going to shoot me. I want to go to a club, you know. We were a little tired of this, he'd say. While the band originally planned on hunkering down into the studio to let the riot pass, the carnage on the news was too much to bear, and Perry wanted to go out into the streets, and that he did. He would even brag about partaking in the looting himself, claiming he got himself a set of huge bronze peacock statues. While the band may or may not have been inspired by the LA riots in naming themselves, they definitely drew an inspiration from the events for their debut album, in addition to several leftover Jane's Addiction tracks. The self-titled track, as well as Packing 25 and Black Girlfriend, would definitely be influenced by the LA riots. Perry would even give his thoughts on the lessons learned from the riots telling Spin Magazine in 1992, 
The underbelly of our country is rotting. It's like having a garbage you keep stuff and garbage in, but the bottom of the garbage can is rotten. We need to have people of this country cared for again. Otherwise, what happened in the riots here in LA are going to happen everywhere, he'd say. When it came to music, Farrell would tell the LA Times where his new project fit into the landscape, revealing rock and roll is a problem of these days where players overplay because they have something to prove. They're trying to outdo each other. It's like a physical thing, like an Olympic event. He would claim that Porno for Powers was different, especially when it came to the songwriting process telling Spin Magazine, we'll work on a song, but it's not done until everybody goes home and hears some crazy thing in their heads. If I say, look, this song is about driving on the freeway at 90 miles per hour, Peter takes off his acoustic guitar. A lot of guitar players don't give a shit what you sing. No one used to ask me what the hell I was saying. The band sounds a little like Jane's, but I think we've stepped up. Even if we didn't, I'm happier. We don't backstab each other, he'd say. The group's self-titled debut record would be delayed due to a dust-up between Perry Farrell and his label Warner Brothers, but the album's original artwork concerned Warner Brothers, who thought it would be misconstrued as being anti-Semitic. In March of 1993, the LA Times reported that Farrell submitted artwork for the cover, which included a six-pointed star with a World War II symbol synonymous with Germany in the middle. Warner Brothers at the time was still reeling from the whole Ice-T cop killer controversy the previous year and Farrell's publicist would tell the Times that the whole thing was a misunderstanding, with the paper writing, and I quote, Ted Maiko, Farrell's publicist, says the whole thing was innocent. The original art, he says, was based on an Indian yantra, an ancient form of incorporating geometric patterns and designs. The symbol appeared in various cultures' art for centuries before the Germans adopted it as a symbol. It was reported at the time that the symbol would be replaced with a little devil, which you can see on the front cover of the album. This wasn't the first time Farrell ran into trouble with his artwork, as Jane's Addiction's records up until this point had some pretty controversial covers that resulted in some stores refusing to carry the albums. The relationship between the members of Porno for Pyros seemed to be pretty positive, as they would vacation together in Bali and Indonesia, and were already writing songs for their second album while they were promoting their first. It only reinforced the widely reported news that Jane's Addiction's tensions came from the friction between Perry Farrell and bassist Eric Avery and guitarist Dave Navarro. And despite Jane's Addiction ending in turmoil, some in the press questioned whether breaking up the band was a good move, given that their sophomore effort sold half a million copies in just a few months after its release. Was it a commercial risk to make such a decision? Well, a promoter who worked with Porno for Pyros would dispel such questions, telling the LA Times, he's certainly not starting from the ground up. We did 4,000 people at their lake show. Nobody has ever played there and nobody had heard them. Released on April 27, 1993, the group's first album debuted at number two on the Billboard charts and within several months, it sold over half a million copies going gold. The press, however, was mixed towards the record. Many comparisons to Jane's addiction were made, with the alternative press writing, there isn't a single reason this album deserves any press, while Rolling Stone gave it 3 out of 5 stars. The biggest hit off the album and an MTV staple would be the single Pets. Released as the second single off the album, it reached number one on the mainstream rock charts. While the song's subject matter deals with how the human race would make great pets for invading aliens, the origins of the song are much darker. The guitar part that DeStefano came up with was much slower than what ended up on a porno for Pyra's first album. He would admit the song was inspired by a girl he dated when he was in the seventh grade named Brianna Dean, revealing it was a song written for a girl that I was in love with. I was in the seventh grade in Lincoln Junior High in Santa Monica, and she was in my cooking class. Still, when I think about her, the love that I feel, you can call it puppy love or whatever, but my heart feels and my stomach drops. It had turned out there had been a Charles Manson type couple that were robbing house after house in Santa Monica, and both the girl and her brother were victims of the couple. He would go on to say, the song, it comes from a very dark place, so when I played it, Perry goes, pick it up, so I did, and he wrote the lyrics to it. I never told the band or anybody where it came from, so I feel like the reason it went to number one and was my biggest hit was because it was Brianna's ghost giving me success, he would say. Days before Porno for Pyro's tour was set to kick off in May of 1993 to promote their first album, an unexpected tragedy happened when Stephen Perkins' brother had died. Some expected the tour to be scrapped, but Perkins played on with only the second night of the tour being rescheduled so he could attend his brother's funeral. The band's live shows seemed like a circus fusing together music with performance art and a sexual sideshow. Exotic dancers, fire eaters, and clowns all made an appearance during Porno for Pyro's concerts, leaving some critics scratching their heads. In addition to that, 
Farrell would hand out thousands of fake $100 bills with his face on the money to members of the audience during their performance of the song Miha. The band probably had no idea that they could land themselves in hot water with the federal government. Counterfeiting money is a serious federal crime and can land someone in jail for 15 years along with a several thousand dollar fine. That's just the crime for printing fake money, but actually circulating it carries a separate but similar penalty. The United States government was no stranger to counterfeit money. Color photocopiers only helped proliferate the rise of counterfeit cash floating around America. And up until 1993, the biggest seizure of counterfeit cash happened in 1989 when the government uncovered a counterfeit operation that was done through a single laser copier in Arizona. After one porno for pyro show in Tampa Bay, a ballsy fan who took home some of the fake money tried to use one of the $100 bills at a local Denny's to pay for his meal. According to the Tampa Tribune, the fake money was accepted at the restaurant, but the store manager quickly realized they had been duped according to Spin Magazine. The bill that was used to pay for the meal bore little to no resemblance to a real $100 bill. In fact, it didn't even feel like real money, it didn't feature any of the security counterfeit protections, and most strikingly, Benjamin Franklin's photo wasn't on the bill. Instead, it was replaced by Perry Farrell's face. The federal and local authorities ended up visiting the Denny's and spoke to the manager. Porno for Powers was set to play a show in Miami after Tampa, but prior to the show, the federal and local authorities raided the amphitheater where the show was set to take place and counted and seized the fake money. The band would be held in custody for several hours and were released with no charges being filed. The band's manager at the time would put out a statement that read, Perry is crushed. He had his own secret supply of money and was hoping to dine out at Denny's for the next 10 years on it. Spin Magazine would report that for subsequent tour dates, Farrell would result to handing out real cash. The following year, Spin Magazine caught up with Farrell, who was juggling Lollapalooza and Porno for Pyros. The interview would show a jaded musician who resented the industry he was making a living off of, telling the magazine why he was disgusted with the record business, saying, Music has all to do with finding yourself. As long as you've got people in the middle that make money from it, you're going to be kept from what music really can do. From its power, he'd say. The group's follow-up album arrived three years later titled Good God's Urge, and while some fans may have expected to see more of the same, the group's sophomore record went in a more post-punk direction. The same forces that helped capsize Jane's addiction were now at work during the making of Porno for Pyro's second record. Drug abuse was running rampant between the members, so much so that bassist Martin Lenoble left midway through the recording of their second album to kick his habit. Miniman bassist Mike Watt would step in. The album was full of guest appearances, with Flea of the Red Hot Chili Peppers contributing to the track Freeway. Fans were most shocked to see Jane's addiction guitarist Dave Navarro appearing on the same track. Only missing of the classic lineup of Jane's addiction was bassist Eric Avery. But Freeway would foreshadow what happened the following year when Jane's Addiction reunited without Avery and Flea filling in on bass. Porno for Pyros would disband in the late 90s due to Jane's Addiction's reunion, other side projects, and guitarist Peter DeStefano's cancer diagnosis. The band would end up reuniting in 2009 for Perry Farrell's 50th birthday, and finally in 2020 the band played a few live shows as part of YouTube's Lollapalooza livestream. On July 20th, 2021, Peter DeStefano announced on his Facebook page that himself, Farrell and Perkins were working on new Porno for Pyro's material, the first in almost two decades. That does it for today's video guys, thanks for watching, be sure to like button and subscribe, and we'll see you again on Rock and Roll True Stories, take care.